It's great to see so many of you here. Uh, let me get started, even while some of you are still finding seats, and I still see some that are available. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen and students of Bentley University, fellow faculty members and staff and distinguished guests, I am delighted to welcome you to the 11th Raytheon Lecture in Business Ethics. My name is Michael Hoffman, and I am the Executive Director of the Center for Business Ethics here at Bentley University. I have been a member of Bentley for about 34 years, and this is the first time I've been able to publicly refer to our institution as a university, although it will take me a little time to get used to it. I'll probably make the mistake of calling it Bentley College more than I want to. Today we will have the pleasure and honor of hearing from a leader in the business of high technology, Mr. John Swainson, Chief Executive Officer of CA, formerly known as Computer Associates, who will deliver a talk entitled, Back from the Brink, Rebuilding a Company After a Near-Fatal Ethics Breakdown. I am well acquainted with CA, and its story is one that has the drama that one would expect more from Hollywood than Long Island, New York, where CA is headquartered. Before Mr. Swainson comes to the podium, I would like to acknowledge the company that has made today's lecture possible, the Raytheon Company. Raytheon is one of the world's leading technology and defense companies, Raytheon has been a long-standing supporter of the Center for Business Ethics and one of our most valued partners. One reason for the strength of this partnership has been Raytheon's commitment to creating a strong ethical culture that pervades the company. I would particularly like to recognize Ms. Patty Ellis, Vice President of Business Ethics and Compliance at Raytheon, for her years of friendship and support to the center. Patty, just say hi. Before beginning our program, I'd like to remind everyone about an important matter of protocol. Oh, me too. Uh, please turn off your cell phones and any other kind of devices that might make noise. You probably knew that before I realized I should. Um, and uh, let, me, um, let me now spend a moment describing what's ahead on our program. In a moment, I will introduce an old and dear friend of mine, Mr. Pat Nazo. Pat is one of the most respected practitioners of business ethics in the field, and also someone who had a leading role creating CA's ethics program. Pat will then introduce Mr. Swainson. In order to make this event as engaging as possible, there will be a question and answer session immediately after the formal presentation. Some of you may have to leave for class before Mr. Swainson has responded to all of the questions. If so, please be sure to do so as quietly as possible, and thank you for that. For those, of, for those who might want to watch a video recording of today's lecture, please note that Bentley is a proud partner in WGBH's forum network, which provides webcasts of selected public lectures from Boston's leading cultural and educational institutions. Mr. Swainson is kindly allowing us to videotape his lecture in order that it can be included in the collection. If you would like to view the lecture at a later date, you'll be able to find it at www.wgbh.org slash forum. That's wgbh.org slash forum. <clears throat> I also want to mention that along with marathon running and rooting for the Red Sox, go Sox, <laughs> listening to a... <laughs> Listening to a good speech is a great stimulus, not only to the mind, but to the body as well. And for this reason, 
you are all welcome to attend a reception in the foyer with food and drinks following the lecture, the foyer being on this floor just down the hall. More importantly, there you can also meet our speaker, Mr. Swainson, and share your thoughts with him. Ladies and gentlemen, over the last couple of weeks, we have seen our share of crises. In fact, we're still in the midst of one. Times such as these are stressful and are tests of one's character and our guiding beliefs. We don't wish such problems on anyone, and yet John Swainson joined CA specifically to lead it out of a crisis and back to stability. For his courage and effort and success, he has earned our respect and admiration, and I look forward immensely to his talk. Now, to introduce Mr. Swainson is another veteran who had a key role in bringing CA back from the brink, the senior vice president and general manager of CA's U.S. public sector business and former chief risk and compliance officer, Mr. Pat Nazo. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back here again. Um, I started at CA in January of 2005. John started around November or December of 2004. And I've worked for many CEOs in my career or senior executives because I worked in the Pentagon for 10 years. And I will tell you that senior executives usually have three really strong attributes if they're successful. <clears throat> First is they have to be well grounded in the things that they're going to be managing. And John is well grounded in IT, information technology, after 26 years with IBM and then three years with us. They have to be sensitive. And John is very sensitive to the employees and to the customers of CA. He responds to every email. Those of you that know anything about compliance and ethics programs, we work a lot to put together third-party anonymous programs and places to call. But our employees go directly to John, and then he passes them along to us to investigate or to deal with, but he answers every email. The third attribute with respect to a CEO is the leader, and John is a leader. And the one point I do want to make with respect to leading from a compliance and ethics perspective is CA is one of the few companies that actually looks at every one of its senior executives, some 200 of them, and applies factors with respect to ethics and compliance. John sits with the chief compliance officer. He sat with me sits today with the chief compliance officer and the general counsel and the head of human resources and goes through every one of the senior executives in the company. And there's a factor of about 10% of the senior executives bonus or incentive compensation that involves ethics and compliance. And that is applied on a yearly basis and then goes to the compensation committee of the board of directors. So John leads by example, and he leads uh, the company through its ethics and compliance program, as all CEOs should. It's a real pleasure to uh, introduce John Swenson. John. Pat, thank you for that. Mike, thanks. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Um, Pat, uh, as you can here played a very key role in the transformation of CA and now leads a very key, has a very key job in our government unit in Washington, D.C. Uh, he is living proof that uh, lawyers can be turned into great businessmen. Um, it's really a pleasure to be in New England on a beautiful autumn day. Um, being on the university campus in October brings a lot of great memories back to me. Uh, but I'm not really here to reminisce about college or football Saturdays. Instead, I'm going to spend about 30 minutes or so uh, talking about uh, my company, CA, a company that lost its way and found its way back. Uh, some of what I'm going to tell you 
no doubt will make you shake your head. Um, it certainly has that reaction with me when I think about it. But if I do this story justice, you will see in the end it's kind of a tale of redemption. And hopefully there's a lot to be learned. Uh, before I get into the gory details, I'd like to applaud Bentley University and Raytheon for sponsoring this forum. Bentley has long been a leader in ethics and was the birthplace, birthplace of the Ethics and Compliance Officers Association, which I understand now has 1,300 members. The strength of this organization speaks volumes about the importance of this issue and about Bentley's leadership. Raytheon is not only a leader in the defense industry, but one of Massachusetts' most important companies. It's also widely admired for its depth and excellence in its ethics and compliance program. Raytheon figured out early on that ethics and compliance were absolutely vital if they were going to be successful and flourish in a global defense market. They do it right. They've got to focus on the core tenets that form a bedrock of an ethical culture. And that's an important point, because the story I'm going to tell you today should serve as a vivid warning about what happens when a company loses sight of those essential principles. I hope you're going to find some inspiration in my account of a long and difficult but ultimately successful battle fought by the people of the organization to reestablish it as one of the most successful companies in its industry on a basis of solid ethics and compliance. I came into the story, as Pat said, in November of 2004, when I was named the president and chief executive officer-elect of a company then called Computer Associates. I arrived at the company's headquarters in Islandia, New York, having spent 26 years at IBM in a variety of engineering, sales, and management positions. IBM was then and is now a well-oiled machine. It had well-thought-out processes, great internal systems, and an ethics and compliance attitude that was ingrained in the culture of the business. In short, IBM acted as a mature company. And mature companies sometimes have problems. But when they have problems, the culture of the company kind of comes together to solve those problems quickly. When I joined CA, I recognized that that culture didn't exist. And furthermore, I recognized that there were not one, but actually two or three fundamental problems. The first was the one that got all the press, a serious accounting issue and its aftermath, which I'll talk about in depth for a few moments. It, because it's important, I think, to understand how these things develop and how companies get into trouble. The second, and a re direct result of the first, was a lack of focus on the business essentials. The company had been going sideways for three or four years. It was diverse and it was unfocused. It was in a rapidly growing industry, but it was not growing at all. In the course of my remarks, I'll try and explain why that was, and how we worked to address those. I'll try and make the point that it does, no, it does no one any good to have an ethical company that is dead. As I got into the company, I realized that these two problems were really symptoms of a third underlying and deeper problem. And that was that the company had never built a single cohesive ethics-based culture in large measure because it had never adequately integrated the dozens of earlier acquisitions. And let me give you just a small kind of anecdotal example of that. When I came to the company and I introduced myself to employees, people said to me things like, hi, I'm Joe, I'm from Platinum, or I'm Harry, I'm from Sterling, or I'm Yogesh, I'm from Ucell. They introduced themselves, they related to themselves, they thought of themselves as members of a culture that CA had acquired in some cases 10 years ago or more. I found very few people, I did find some, but very few people who said they were CA people. 
All of these people's identities were firmly rooted in their former companies, not even in the present, and certainly not looking towards the future. But let me come back to the story. I walk into CA in November 2004. The immediate priority was to address the aftermath of the accounting scandal. There is a basic rule of business. When you're in a hole, stop digging. Um, or if you're in a leaky boat, plug the leak. All of these metaphors speak to the same thing. Focus on the most critical problem and fix that. In our case, there was an issue around the credibility of the company's financial statements, which had, had its basis in a problem of revenue recognition and exacerbated by problems of obstruction of justice, including document destruction. This mess had dragged on for years and ultimately resulted in the firing and indictment of many top executives, including the CEO, the CFO, the head of sales, and the general counsel. By the way, it's rare that you have that broad a swath of executives indicted and, and, and implicated in problems such as this. The board had investigated, and ultimately that investigated culminated in what's called a deferred prosecution agreement. And I'll talk about that in a moment, but in this agreement, the company agreed to pay back to shareholders more than $225 million in restitution and institute a number of structural, systematic, and process changes. So that's the world I dropped into. Uh, as someone said, it was just a dream job. Um, but now I've dropped you into the middle of this story. Let me go back a little bit and give you a bit of context, a short description of the company uh, that we call today CA. Simply put, our business at CA is to provide large IT users with the software they need to effectively manage their IT resources. Uh, there's demand for our technology because all of the stuff that lives inside of a data center, including hardware, software, applications, network switches, storage devices, all of that stuff needs to be managed. And at the same time, companies need to make sure that their IT environment is secure, data is protected, and only the right people get access to the information. Though you may not have heard of us, believe me, we're good at what we do, what we do, and we're the leader in our field. We help chief, ex chief information officers of some of the world's largest users of technology manage their IT environments so that IT can be something that enables business success rather than a drag on the profitability and resources of the company. We generate almost $4.5 billion of revenue a year and have a market cap, depending on how Wall Street feels, of around $10 billion. CA was started over 30 years ago by a very smart, very tough entrepreneur who, as an immigrant from China, in many ways embodied the American dream. He had a vision that software could be used to make IT more effective and more efficient. And CA's initial focus was on doing just that. Over the years, we've expanded from that focus initially on the mainframe to more and more complex and diverse heterogeneous distributed environments. The company at the time was run like a family. There were lots of cutting edge benefits long before they became popular. Everything from free breakfasts and dinner programs to full service fitness centers, childcare, even on site Montessori schools. And a huge dedication that persists to this day to volunteerism and community service. It was a dot com attitude before there was a dot com. This way of operating served the company extremely well for many years. CA was known for being aggressive, entrepreneurial, and opportunistic. It grew from a startup to a corporation with thousands of employees. But as it got bigger, it didn't institute or put in place the internal infrastructure that bigger companies need to control their business processes and manage their business. And with few internal controls or checks and balances, it became an environment where bad behavior could and did flourish the kind of behavior that very nearly brought the company down. The center of this story 
and really the center of most scandals in business, is one of the seven deadly sins, namely greed. Greed makes people do things they know they shouldn't do. Greed makes people think they're invincible. Greed even makes people think they're invisible. Greed makes honest people do honest things. Greed makes ethical behavior disappear, and when that happens, everything falls apart. The tipping point in the CA story happened long before the events of the recent past. It actually happened in the mid-1990s, when CA's board of directors was persuaded to put in place a stock option plan that would reward the top three executives, including the founder and his heir apparent, with a payout of more than a billion dollars. Remember, this was the mid-1990s. A billion dollars was then a lot of money. I guess it still is. Um, <laughs> If the, comp- the, the terms of this were if the company had to, the stock price of the company had to hit certain targets over an extended period of time. Now, I'm sure that as they were going through this, the board felt that this was a good idea. The company was go- growing rapidly. They wanted to incent and retain the company's leadership. But even in the compensated, exaggerated, go-go times of the late 90s, this was a little bit over the top. The payout was predicated on moving the stock stock price upward and keeping it there for certain periods of time. To do that, the company had to consistently hit or exceed the numbers that Wall Street expected. And any of you who have looked at public companies or have worked at publicly traded companies knows about the pressure to make numbers. If you miss Wall Street earnings per share estimates or revenue consensus, The market can punish you and take 5 to 10% of your value away in the matter of hours. Just last night, SAP missed their earnings by a bit and lost 14.5% of their value. So the market can be very unforgiving. And that doesn't make shareholders happy. And when the shareholders aren't happy, obviously, the senior managers become unhappy. And since so much of senior manager compensation was tied to the share price, the pressure on the management team to make the numbers became intense. So, in an effort to keep the stock price up and cash in on this $1 billion award, the top managers of CA started to play with revenue. Now, I'm not an accountant, I'm just an engineer, but I've learned more about accounting in the last four years than perhaps I ever wanted to know. So you'll forgive me if my accounting is a little simplified but I need to describe to you a little bit about software accounting rules. Now, the rules of revenue recognition are fairly clear. Simply put, if you close a deal on September 30th, it's recorded as a September quarter quarter event. If it closes the next day, on October 1st, it's a December quarter event. In a business like CA's, which has a large number of large deals, the swing of even one deal one day can make a, have a material effect on your annual on your results and you can miss a quarter easily if you miss just one deal and although current accounting standards dictate that all documents must be final and in the company's hands at the end of the quarter at the beginning of this process the standards were more lax and there was some amount of flexibility allowed to enable companies to do things like assemble all the documents in a central place. Remember, this was in the late 90s. We didn't have the technology we have today for scanning. People relied more on faxes. A lot of things got mailed. There was a legitimate reason why there might be a little bit of flexibility. And the company, to its eternal discredit, uh, saw this flexibility and manipulated it. They started keeping the books open longer after the end of the quarter, not simply to assemble the paperwork, but to, in some cases, close deals that had not been made in order to meet the expectations of Wall Street and the analysts. In doing that, CA's senior managers not only violated the spirit of the accounting standards of the day, but they broke the law. At the quarter end, if they needed another $50 million of revenue, they would keep the books open until contracts sufficient came in to meet it. Most of the time, they kept the books open for five days. Later on, 
the prosecution, the Department of Justice, would refer to this as CA's 35-day month. But if anything, this characterization was mild because we have cases where the books were open for nine days. You can see what happens. You can probably figure out what happens as this perpetuates itself. If you move $50 million from the current quarter back to the previous one, you're left with a $50 million hole in the current quarter that you need to fill. So you fix that by taking it from the next quarter, and so on. By the time the practice was ended in mid-2000, CA was moving hundreds of millions of dollars across, across quarter-ed boundaries every fiscal year. Now, in order to also compensate for some of this, they did deals that didn't, weren't legitimate or didn't make business sense. For example, some senior managers created so-called phantom deals, and they worked a little bit like this. CA would book the sale of software to a company for a certain amount. In exchange, CA would purchase software or services from that company for an almost identical sum. In reality, no software changed hands, no services were given, and both companies booked the revenue. Desperate people do desperate things. Now, CA had always had a reputation as a tough but fair company, but as the revenue situation got worse, it's, it became more and more desperate, and its behavior towards customers, partners, and employees became increasingly aggressive. By the time the stock option plan, the stock plan was paid out in the late 90s, employee morale was dropping, customer relationships were deteriorating, and rumors about CA's business practices were swirling. In early 2002, after a series of scathing investigative articles in the Wall Street Journal, the government began to investigate. And it appears, to shorten that whole process greatly, it appears that over the next couple of years, CA's senior management spent the majority of their time conspiring to block the investigations both of the board of directors and the government. The attention of these, these executives became focused on solely on putting roadblocks in front of the investigations. Preoccupied with saving their own skins, the leaders really didn't have time to think about the company's future. The investigations came to head in late 2003 and 2004 with more than 15 executives fired, of whom seven were indicted of crimes, and the initiation of something called a deferred prosecution of the agreement with the government in September of 2004. The CEO, who was one of the executives fired and then indicted, was later, later convicted for his role in the scandal and is currently serving a 12-year prison sentence. That's the company I came to in November of 2004. CA was operating under this deferred prosecution agreement with a full-time government investigator on the premises. The company's reputation had been through the shredder its business was stagnant, its competitors were having a field day with our customers, and we were losing our best people. It was, in short, a nightmare. Now, not all was lost. The, the board of directors had done a great job of getting to the bottom of the accounting problems and in stabilizing many aspects of the company. Enough cannot be said about how people, all of whom had other jobs, stepped in to keep the place afloat. Lesser people and lesser companies, less resilient companies, would have gone belly up by now. The company was still going. Now we had to get it moving again. So on my first day at the company, I, I sensed there were going to be three distinct tasks. The first, first was to fulfill the terms of the DPA and successfully complete the agreements with the government. Let me take a minute to give you a short primer on deferred prosecution agreements. The government has used DPAs, I think, over 50 times in the last decade. When it determines that a company has broken the law, but believes that an outright indictment would put the company out of business and therefore cause thousands of, of innocent employees to lose their jobs and further punish the already injured shareholders. So in a DPA, the government agrees to set a prosecution aside 
provided that the company agrees to fulfill a series of reforms within a determined time period. If the company satisfies the terms of the agreement, the government will then drop its prosecution and the company can move on. A DPA is a way to give a company another chance, but only if it completes very tough conditions and satisfies an independent observer that it has done so. So that was the first priority. The second priority, had, and that had to be done in parallel, was to get the company growing again. And that meant reevaluating the product portfolio, radically overhauling the way the sales force worked, and, and interacted with customers. And the third, but probably most important, priority was to re-energize a dispirited employee base so that they would believe in the company again and have the energy and will to support its transformation. And while all of that looks pretty simple, the problem was that all of these things had to be done at the same time. It was somewhat akin to a musician who makes music by strapping a bass drum on his back, cymbals on his elbow and knees, and a kazoo in his mouth. In short, a lot of effort goes into making one coherent sound. And while we didn't operate on these issues in a linear way, for the sake of clarity, I'll try and deal with each one of them separately as if we had, and start with our successful efforts at satisfying the terms of the Deferred Prosecution Agreement. Now, the DPA, which is this agreement with the government, sets out a set of distinct requirements. The first is an admission of wrongdoing by the company. And that was the easy part because the company had screwed up purely and simply. The second part was to complete a list of specific conditions and corporate governance reforms, including terminating those who were responsible. I talked about that. Appointing a new management team, which is where I came in. Adding several new independent directors to the board. Establishing an, a compliance program and disclosure committees and providing company-wide comprehensive ethics training, which is the role Pat played, paying $225 million in restitution to investors, changing a number of business procedures and upgrading our IT systems. I'll talk about why that was included in a moment. Hiring a chief compliance officer, that was Pat. Reorganizing the finance function, establishing a stronger internal audit program, uh, which really means establishing an internal audit program. Incredibly, for a company of this size, it basically did not have one. And importantly, instituting something that they call tone at the top, which is really a philosophy that says that an ethics program starts with the chief executive officer and only works if he or she takes responsible for the promotion of ethical behavior in the business and that nothing short of ethical behavior would be tolerated. As I also indicated, the court that supervised our DPA named an independent examiner to oversee our efforts. And for the next couple of years, Lee Richards, a New York-based attorney, actively worked with us to change our policies and practices and develop that robust corporate culture that would ensure that the type of accounting scandal that happened at CA could never happen again. The list of requirements in the DPA were all very necessary and were aimed at making us a better, more efficient operating company and also an ethical and effective competitor and a better corporate citizen. Even without a DPA hanging over your head, every company wants to meet those goals. Now, as I've noted, one of the the terms of the DPA was that we hire a senior level compliance officer. And getting the right person into this job was going to be crucial to our success in building CA's culture. As you've heard, we hired Pat, who was at the time the chief compliance officer, compliance officer at UTC, United Technology Corporation, and had been for over 10 years. Pat had an incredible reputation for fairness and, and common sense as well as a very broad standing in the client compliance community. At CA, he reported directly to the Audit and Compliance Committee and had unfettered access to everybody in the building as he executed his compliance and ethics programs. He had the ability to buttonhole any executive, including me, and he routinely did that. 
He was a great leader and compliance officer, and he brought best practices from the whole industry and from his time at UTC to CA. He set up things like a compliance hotline, a state-of-the-art ethics training program, and significantly improved our ability to investigate problems if and when we did hear about them. Probably the most important thing that Pat brought to his position was his proposition that good business ethics is just good business. As basic as that might sound, it's important to remind everyone that we don't win unless we win ethically. Anything else is unacceptable. So to wrap up this portion of the talk, I'm happy to report that we did meet all the conditions of the Deferred Prosecution Agreement, and the government agreed in May 2007 to dismiss the pending charges. Now, as we were doing this, we were also dealing with the question of how to overhaul our business and get it growing again. As I've said, growth, this was a growing industry. It is a growing industry. And part of the industry, part of the problem was that CEA had become so preoccupied by this burgeoning scandal that its leadership team wasn't doing anything else. The company felt besieged by government investigators and hostile media reports, and, the, and, and as a result became much more inwardly focused. And that meant we weren't paying attention to what was happening in our market, with our customers, and therefore we're not paying attention to our responsibility to our shareholders. The problem, however, went deeper. And as I said at the very beginning, it had many of its roots in the way the company had grown in the first place. Although CA had once been the world's largest independent software company, reaching a billion dollars in revenue before even Microsoft did, more than 50 acquisitions had turned it more into a conglomerate of software assets than a software company. What's more, the company's paternalistic, founder-based culture continued to shape its organization and management long after the time when the company had outgrown those roots. CA's managers routinely relied on gut feelings rather than the hard data produced by business systems. So we had to rebuild the company on many levels, but everything depended on our ability to repair the relationships with our customers and regain their trust. We also had to re restart the machine of innovation, which allowed us to deliver new products into the marketplace. When I joined the company, I knew that we had a reputation for somewhat troubled customer relationships. I also knew that customers liked our products and considered them very solid. But those lack of relationships or those troubled relationships, especially with the senior executives and our customers, impeded our ability to learn about opportunities and to sell our products. So addressing this problem became a key priority. During this period of time, we spent a lot of time talking to our customers. I personally went to most of them over the course of the first year, and it was eye-opening. While not pleasant, it gave me a much better view of what we needed to do to get the company working properly again. It quickly became clear to us that we needed to structure our sales force in a way that allowed it to form better relationships and enduring partnerships with our customers. We had a very transactionally oriented sales force and they were more focused on coming in, closing a deal, and then leaving, and not necessarily sticking with the customer for the long haul. We changed all of that. We assigned our best salespeople to a relatively small number of customers and gave them responsibility for selling new software to those customers. One reason that our sales force hadn't been spending as much time with our key customers was that they had too many, and they were spread over too many accounts. So we reduced the number of accounts we covered to just a few thousand and served the rest through a network of partners. We also changed the way we paid people. Instead of quoting them on transactions, we set their quotas and paid them on their ability to grow our business with our customers. So now instead of having a sales force that only shows up when there is a renewal, we have one that is deeply engaged working with its customers. It's made an enormous difference in both our relationships with our customers and our success in selling new software. Now, having spent almost 30 years, in fact, more than 30 years in this business, I've learned many things, but chief among them is 
to be successful in selling new software, you have to have new software to sell. Um, now, that may sound simple and completely obvious, but in fact, when I came to CA, a second problem I found was that we really had not developed anything new in a very long time. The innovation machine, as I call it, had been shut off. The product portfolio was tired, to put it mildly. So another one of the tasks was to go and assess that portfolio and determine what was going to actually drive our growth for the future. Over the first three months, I spent endless, endless hours with product development teams learning the strengths and weaknesses of our products and our offerings. By the end of this process, we had a pretty good idea of what a basic strategy could be and also the pieces that we needed to build or buy to realize that strategy. We put in place a roadmap for the company. Over the first two years, we, we did more than 15 acquisitions and spent more than a billion and a half dollars. Most of them were small, but some of them were in the two to three hundred million dollar range. However, unlike CA of old, when we, who, bought company, who bought companies just for their customers, we were now buying state-of-the-art technology that would bolster our current offerings and in some cases get us into adjacent markets where there were natural synergies. We had a program of strategic and not opportunistic acquisitions and we worked to make sure that we did more than just integrate the technology. We did everything we could to integrate the new people into CA. Now I also discovered that the market was confused about what CA stood for and what its overall strategy really was. Because of the 50 acquisitions that we'd made prior to 2000, CA had products in virtually every segment of the software space. So today, CA primarily provides software to manage large IT environments. But over time, we had created software or had acquired software in applications, enterprise resource planning, and consumer software. There was even a product in the 1990s for doing your individual tax return. Now, why a vendor of enterprise software would be selling something like that is sort of anyone's guess. So, we decided to create a corporate technical vision. And we gave it a name. We called it Enterprise IT Management, or EITM. And focused it on the things that we knew we did well helping customers unify and simplify their IT environments and tie IT environments to their business objectives. This is not intended to be a technology discussion, and I won't go into the details, but suffice to say that in a large organization, IT has become incredibly complex, hard to manage, and is sometimes not doing what it's supposed to do to drive business success. We're dedicated to fixing that. Ironically, we discovered early on in this process that our own IT systems and business processes were not serving us very well and needed to be radically changed in order to give us the data and process efficiency that we needed to run the business. For example, we didn't actually know what it was costing us to build products. We didn't have a P&L statement by either geography or business unit, which is just completely unacceptable. This is a disgrace for a software company but it's more than embarrassing because it was part of what had put the company at risk. The lack of controls, lack of data, and lack of systems had in some cases allowed this fraudulent behavior to go on for years without being detected. So we started a major retooling effort to implement an ERP system and retire some of our ancient legacy applications, which proved to be essential as we had to pass Sarbanes-Oxley Part 404 in that very first year. Finally, all of our hopes and dreams for CA and all of our ability to achieve our objectives depended on our success in re-energizing our employees. We needed to transform CA into a company with a global performance-driven culture of ethics. And we had to communicate a clear strategy and a compelling rationalization, compelling rationale, I should say, to stay the course with CA to an employee population that had been disillusioned and lost their trust with their management team. To that end, we made performance and accountability an important part of our core values, as well as one of our key business priorities. 
and we aligned our performance management system more closely with CA's goals, objectives, and compensation. We strive to let our employees know what is expected of them and what role they individually play in CA's success. I firmly believe that you cannot communicate these things enough. If you think you've done an outstanding job of communication, you haven't done enough. Go even further. In the almost four years that I've been at CA, I've done literally hundreds of town hall meetings in every CA location across the globe. Sometimes it's in front of large groups of customers, and other times it's just me and a couple of, sorry, large groups of employees, and sometimes it's just me and a couple of employees sitting around a table having a coffee. This is not enough. I supplement the meetings with an internal blog where I talk about what's on my mind or deal with questions that I've heard from them in their meetings. As you might imagine, the most recent one of these that I wrote was about what is the impact of the financial crisis on our company. Now, a lot of people ask me if I write these myself, and the answer is yes, absolutely I do. And I only let them, I only allow them to be changed if I get threatened by my lawyers. Um, you do have to have, if you're the chief executive officer, you do have to have lawyers review your blog. Um, of course, there's lots of other internal communication vehicles, employee memos, video leadership perspectives, a question and answer forum called Ask John. And as Pat said, all the employees know that they can write me directly and I'll get back to them. We poll our population every year. We've seen dramatic improvements in morale and trust in senior management. But what I'm most gratified by is the fact that when we ask our questions, sorry, when we ask our employees, do you clearly understand the importance of core values and ethical behavior? 98% of them, which, you know, accepting the fact that there's always going to be 2% who answer the question wrong, 98% say yes, which, which is an astonishing number, particularly in a company with our history. In conclusion, we've made a lot of progress. We've completed seven quarters of very solid performance. We've put the regulator, regulatory issues behind us, and we have built the strongest portfolio of products in our existence. Our customer satisfaction continues to improve. Of course, we've still got lots to work, of work to do, and I'm pleased at the product we're making. We have the vision of what it takes to become a leader in the enterprise management software space. But we all understand that all of this hard work can be undone in the blink of an eye if there's another major ethical breach. Four years ago, the media used to refer to us as, and I quote, Computer Associates, the scandal-ridden software company. The only words that I actually liked in that description were software company. Um, we then progressed, if you can call it that, to CA, in quotes, the struggling software maker. Now we are referred to as CA, one of the largest independent software companies. It's a metaphor, small but real victory. Now, when it comes to ethical behavior, you have to prove yourself every day. Every employee from the senior management to the first-day first employee has to believe it and to live it. It's something that has to be top of mind all the time. I've seen and you've now heard how unethical behavior on a very small, by a very few people can spiral out of control, ultimately destroy lives, and potentially destroy companies. CA, an organization with more than 14,000 dedicated, hardworking men and women around the globe, a company upon whom thousands of customers rely, was very nearly brought down in this way. Today, we're back on track. Employees are proud of where they work. Customers want to do business with us. And we're being measured by the value we provide to them, our customers, and to our shareholders, which is how it should be. Regaining the reputation and credibility has been a long and arduous make process. And at times, I wondered if we would be able to make it. But we did. And we can't and won't go back. Thanks very much. I'd be delighted to answer some of your questions. Mike's going to come up and help me.
the people coming down to get microphones. Asim is coming, and Christina is coming, so they will bring a microphone to you so we can get your question on uh, uh, tape and also have it heard, and John will uh, answer it for you. Okay, uh, questions? This one here, sir. And could you identify yourself, and then we'll go from there. I'm Brooke Hamilton. I'm a visiting scholar at the Ethics Center. And Hi. Real pleased to be here. And thank you for your talk. You. If, if we were a new group of employees and you had five minutes or two minutes to tell us what those core values were that, that run your company and, and how you get them down to the level of the way in which a salesman interacts with a customer, what, could, what would you tell us? Um, well, I could recite for them our the five kind of elements of our core values. But, you know, most of the time what I like to do is use a very simple metaphor that was taught to me about 30 years ago. And that is, you know, never do anything that you would be ashamed to describe to your mother. Um, and, you know, that speaks so much, I think, of what this is all about. If, if, if you're doing things in business that need you know, a lot of flamboyant explanation and kind of hyperbola to, to describe, then maybe there is something that you're doing that's not quite right. And if you can get that ingrained, you can get that idea that it's simply about doing the right things and be able, not ashamed to talk about them to anyone, then I think you're well on your way. Of course, you can talk about integrity, trust, performance, and, and we do all of those things and we share with them our code of ethics and, and we go through, but it ultimately comes down to don't do anything that you would be ashamed to describe to your mother. Next question? Yes, Christina up there. And uh, anybody over here, let me just pick you out. Anybody got a question yet? Okay. One there. I see you. Up there, they're going to be next. Hi. 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 Thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. My name is Paula Anderson, and I'm a member of the staff at the Ethics and Compliance Officer Association. Right. And my question to you is, how did you approach your customers in rebuilding their trust and relationship? I mean, what was the approach you used um, besides, you know, just telling them that things were going to change? Um. It's a very interesting question. Did you all hear it? The question is, how, how do you go to customers in, in an environment where there's clearly something wrong? Um, with a good deal of humility, I think, is the starting point. You can't, you can't walk in there and expect that they are going to understand right off the bat that everything's different just because you're the new guy on the block. Now, I, I must tell you that I had... Uh, from 26 years of experience, I knew a lot of these customers already, so I had a fair bit of personal credibility. And I brought that personal credibility to the table, and it at least allowed me to have an audience with them. Uh, and that personal credibility said, look, I wouldn't have taken this job, I wouldn't have done this if I didn't think it could be fixed, and that if we weren't going to make substantial changes. And then I went on to describe the things that I thought were wrong and the things that I was committed to fix. And I asked them for their input on what they would like to see change. Now, as you can imagine, the, the range of reactions was all across the map. Um, I, I like to tell the story that um, part of what, what I discovered early on uh, as I went around was that as, as I talked to customers, particularly outside the New York area, I got various levels of outrage at things that had happened, sometimes in the long past. And, and then when I went back and called on customers in Manhattan, I got this reaction, well, yeah, you know, we kicked them in the head, but it doesn't matter because they kick us back and everything's fine. Uh, I, I, I realized that to some extent we had applied Manhattan-style business practices to the, um, the uh, management of customers outside Manhattan, which I can assure you does not work. Um, doesn't necessarily even work in Manhattan, but there's a certain rough and tumble on what was Wall Street. God knows what it is now. But 
there was a certain rough and tumble that, that, that used to at least be considered to be acceptable business practice. Um, so a little bit of humility, uh, personal credibility. And, and look, I'm not under any illusions. That was partly why I was hired uh, as someone who had come from a company with a reputation for business ethics. Um, I, I came with some of that um, in, you know, embodied in me and then a, set, a, a willingness to sit down and listen to customers and hear them through, including listening to sometimes horrendous stories. Um, you know, there, there, were, there was everything from you know, people who told me that there had been personal threats about them made to their bosses, and, you know, situations that they'd been in with the company, you know, horrible stuff. And yet you hear them through this a cathartic process that goes on, and eventually you get to the other side where you agree that maybe there's a basis on which you can do business if you make the changes that you're describing. It, it, in some cases, um, you, you get back to neutrality. In other cases, I can tell you, um, a very large insurance company um, up, up here in, in, in this area, as a matter of fact, uh, when, I, when I took this job, I met with the CIO who I had known, uh, and he said to me, look, um, we're concerned, my, my boss, uh, the chief executive officer, is concerned. We have a policy. We don't do business with unethical companies. This company actually has a formal policy. They only do business with ethical companies. And we're not sure you guys are an ethical company. Um, so, and this company we had a $10 million a year relationship with. I'm not sure we can continue to do business with you. So he said, you have to come up and see my chief executive officer, and maybe even see my board and tell them what you're going to do to turn this around. And, and I did that, and, and I'm pleased to tell you that that has turned into a great relationship, and the, the size of the relationship has doubled over the last four years. But it's those kinds of things. You know, this is very serious stuff. Hi, uh, Hi. my name is Ari Reutenberg. I'm a sophomore here at Bentley. And um, I can imagine your company's tied in very much with uh, a lot of the, the banks and investment um, houses that are facing the crisis today. And I uh, just want to know what you think is the impact on your company and the industry as a whole and how you see uh, you moving forward from it. Um, the, the, the question is what, is, what impact does the financial crisis have on us? The simple answer is I don't know. Um, in, in the short term, we have a very conservative business model in which we book everything on long-term contracts and all ratably. Um, so in any given period, not much uh, can happen because we don't book revenue on that basis. But obviously, uh, we, are, we do business with most of the big financial institutions, and uh, we're watching and looking with concern about what happens. Um, to some extent, I'm somewhat uh, eased by the fact that our software tends to be very deeply embedded in the infrastructure of these businesses. So they literally can't process a statement or process a transaction without our software being involved. So we're very sticky in their businesses. And, and to the extent that these businesses continue in some form, perhaps under a different label, our technology will still be used. Uh, but it's right now kind of anyone's guess as to what the I'd say, medium-term impact of this is going to be. And I, I, and I don't have a better answer than that. I'm sorry. Uh, next question. Yes, Christina, I see a hand here. And how about, okay, and Hussein, right down there. Hi. Please excuse my voice. Um, I'm Jessica, and I'm a senior here at Bentley, and I'm just curious as to how your, what specifically your company, company implemented as ethical um, when immediately after the scandal and how the employees received, and also do you think that similar policies that you implemented could have possibly worked in any extent at the, the Enrons and the WorldComs? Um. It's a very difficult question to answer uh, because I would tell you every situation. Could you just oh, it? I mean, it uh, sometimes I don't know. Yeah, I'm trying to think of how to, how to repeat that. Uh, 
to what extent what, did what we, was what we did repeatable in a broader scale, and would it have worked perhaps in an Enron or a World Farm or something like that? Is that, is that the core of your question? Um, every, every company situation is different. So I, I would be very reluctant to say that what we did would have worked in those situations. I mean, remember Enron, there was no company, you know, 90 days later. I mean, the company basically collapsed. It was founded... Uh, it, it, the, the, the accounting problems there were so fundamental that the whole thing blew up when the problems were exposed. At CA, there was no phantom revenue, or, or, or with one exception, the one I gave you, there was no phantom revenue. All of the money had been just moved from period to period, and it was a very serious problem to be sure, but there were still real customers and they were paying real money for real products. So, so the basis of the company was, was sound. And that was what enabled us to rebuild it. We still had real people, we still had real company, real customers, and we still had real products. I would argue that in some of these other cases, they didn't have any of those, or they were missing one or more of them. And so it was possible for us to build an ethics compli and compliance program on top of something that was real. You can't build a program like this on something that's not real. If, it, if it's all based on sort of phony accounting stuff, and it blows up on you, what's there to build on? And I, that, I think, was very much the case in Enron. And did we catch the first part of your question? I'm not sure I did, because I didn't quite hear it. I was just curious. You keep saying these ethical implementations. What specifically did you do at your company to ah. make it become an ethical well, environment? We, we, over the course of a couple of years, we put in place a whole series of programs, things as basic as we wrote, we created a code of ethics, and we told people, look, this is what it means to be a CA employee. And we, we've turned that into a pamphlet, and we, we, we taught everybody what it meant, and we gave them little green cards that they could attach to their employee badges. And we built that into the employee evaluation process. So we started to take this whole notion of ethical culture and embed it into what they were doing. So that was first piece. Second piece was we created mechanisms, feedback mechanisms, for people to tell us if there was something going wrong. And, and, and you know, in, in big companies, there are often people who know that there are bad things happening. They just don't know a way of getting from where they are to where you are. And, and so we gave them employee hotlines and anonymous, you know, anonymous ways of, of making their concerns known. And, and then put in place a real mechanism behind that to actually go and investigate it so that if something happened, we could actually find out what was wrong. Um, we, God, we, we, we created courses. We made everyone take these courses. Um, we, still, we still do that. Um, you know, so we did a lot of education stuff. I did an enormous number of just speeches where I got, got up in front of people and said, you know what, we almost died. And we almost died because a few people did some bad stuff. And everything that we're doing now could go for naught if people do it again. So, you know, tried to make it very simple, very basic, very much, you know, get it to register home with people. We obviously put in place more accounting controls. I, I mentioned the fact that we set up a, 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 we had no functioning internal audit organization. A company of 14,000 people, $4 billion of revenue, had no internal audit. It's unbelievable. You know, so, we, we, so we did a lot of things that were sort of process-based or structural, and then we did a lot of things that were cultural and educational. Did I, did I forget anything? A lot. I mean, we did a lot of, we did a, ton, we did a whole bunch more, too. I'm, I'm just making sure with Pat that I caught all the highlights, because those are the ones that just come to mind. Um, Pat and I did thousands and thousands of speeches and videos and letters and little you know, notes to people. That's part of what you were talking about yeah. in terms of tone at the top. I think. Yeah, that's all tone at the top. And, and the CEO has to do it. You, you can't delegate it. I mean, chief compliance officer is your partner in this. He or she helps you, prompts you on you know, best practices and things to do. But if you don't believe it, if you're not prepared to stand up in front of you know, a couple of thousand employees and say, look, this is the way we're going to do it. And if you don't want to do it this way, go somewhere else because that's not what we do at CA. If you're not prepared to do that every day, then you're not prepared to have, you can't have the job. It, it is, it has become, maybe it always was, an absolute prerequisite for a chief executive officer position. 
take a couple more questions. Uh, Sam, you had something? <clears throat> On top of what you were just talking about, um, you are. I'm Andrew Barberi, a senior at Bentley College. Hi, Ed. Um, on top of that question, uh, when implementing those internal controls, was it easy? Was it? How was the transition process for the customers or for the um, employees? Because it was a totally different implementation of the internal controls, and. Uh, did the customers like, or the, did the employees trust the new system? Uh, well, the, the, I'm going to separate internal controls, which is sort of an accounting idea. You know, the, the whole notion of internal controls is something that was popularized by Sarbanes Oxley. It's actually a much older idea than that. But the notion of internal controls is a business process notion. The notion is that everything you do, you have a way of validating. And Sarbanes-Oxley, and Sarbanes-404 in particular, prescribed a set of tests to ensure that as a company you had those. Um, and that's part of building the structure of a company that is in compliance. Ethics is more than that. Ethics is culture. It's not structure. Structure is something that you can hit with a hammer. Culture is something that people have in their heads. And, and so there's two very different approaches. You have to do both. You can't build a culture without structure, and you can't build a structure without culture, but you need to do both, both of them. And we, had to do, we did both of them at the same time and had to pass Sarbanes 404 and had to pass the Deferred Prosecution Agreement and, and all the other stuff. And had to ultimately pass in the court of our employees' opinion and in the court of our customers' opinion. And so we had sort of four tests going at once. I'm going to take one more question. Uh, I have, oh, yes. Chuck Hyken, right there. Uh, Chuck Hyken, a parent of a graduate. Uh, what advice would you give to the president to employ governmental resources to restore stability to the financial community? <laughs> um, it, it's a question that I don't think I'm qualified to answer, Chuck. I, 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 I think Mr. Bernanke and Mr. Paulson have done you know, yeoman service in diagnosing and attempting to solve the problem. Uh, I really don't think I can bring more to the table than that. My, my you know, sort of view is as a technology CEO, I'm certainly not a banker, um, but I applaud what they're doing, and I think all of us need to hope that they are successful. Okay, let's give... Uh, Mr. Swain. John, thank you so much. Pleasure.